India, my India. You know, people call it the incredible India. It's a land of diversity. In the middle of all this incredible India thing, there's a nation that is desperately in need. I started my ministry in the South, and God brought me to Delhi, and I'm staying here from 1980 with my wife and my children. And God enabled me to go around the different parts of this country, through state after state, starting churches in places where nobody ever went, like Virgin Land, and I started churches. And today I'm so pleased to say that we have more than 4,500 churches, which will comprise of almost 600,000 people who have come to the Lord through the ministry that God enabled me to start almost 44 years ago. In the midst of this amazing nature of this nation, what really attracted me was the immense needs of the millions of people. The millions of children on the streets, orphans who got nobody to help. hundreds of orphan children. In all through my 70s sewing schools. And help me. Let us build this ministry together. stand and welcome our guest, Dr. Abraham. Come on, stand up, give him a nice welcome. All the way from India. Come on, give him a nice welcome this morning. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Thanks for coming today. I was just thinking like Pastor Alex, you know, I'll be preaching to him and Judy today. <laughs> but now you have become an interruption for us. <laughs> well, hallelujah. Our God is a good God. Amen? Nothing happens without his knowledge. And God's covering is upon every one of us. Hallelujah. We live pretty close to China. We got a big border between China and India. And uh, we are two largest nations in the world. India has got 1.3 billion people. And, uh, but we trust God. And uh, God is so gracious to us. And I want to thank Pastor Alex for having me to come be and be with you and have the privilege and honor to share with you today my life story. You just heard a little bit of that. And uh, if anybody is interested to see the whole uh, video, which is about 18 minutes, and this has been cut short on that. And if you go online, 
and you will be able to see the whole story of what God has done through our life. Amen. Well, I, my name is Abraham and uh, I'm an Indian, as you can see it. And I was born in India and I live in India because people always ask me, well, where are you living? Are you coming from, from Miami? I said, no. I live in India. I come here for just a short visit, you know, to ministry in churches, sharing my vision, and I go back. So I live in India, and one day I'm planning to die in India. That's a plan. I told that to the Lord. I said, whenever I get on the plane, and when, when the plane is ready to take off, and, and I'll say to the Lord, what's the plan? Are you planning to take me home in this trip? If that's the plan, we are turning the plane around and going back home. Amen? I'm not coming. And because I would like to literally sow myself into the land of India, for which I have dedicated my life for the last 45, 46 years. And um, I was saved when I was 16 years old. I was a pretty bad boy. You know, I still remember I, I was such a pain to my, my mother especially and dad. And I remember they used to complain, people complain about me all the time. And it was a regular thing. I will come home and my mother will quietly open the door so that my dad won't hear me coming in. And she'll open the door and turn towards the wall and she'll bang her head against the wall and and I, I don't think it's a prayer. She'll say something like this, God, why not a bus will run over him and he'll be dead. And other times she'll say, why not a uh, lightning will strike him? Why not a cobra will bite him? And I used to think, what a crazy woman I have. Because I'm the only son among five sisters and I'm the only hope for the family. If you know anything about India, you know, the boys bring dowry and you have to pay dowry to get your girls married away. And imagine my father having five daughters. He was bankrupt even before he started. <laughs> and I'm the only hope. And my mother was saying that I should be dead, but that's how horrible I was. But Jesus loved me. And he saved me and changed my life. And uh, I went through the university, I got a degree and all that, I got a job. I was a good sportsman at that time. Do you, do you know what table tennis is? Like what do you call ping pong here? What do you call that? You all call all bad names, you know? So I used to be a champion on table tennis pretty high up. So, well, if there is any young person here thinking about wanting to challenge me, don't even think of that, you know, because the result will be like this, I win and you lose, you know. Well, don't you have a nice humble servant of God all the way from India today, you know. So I got a very good job, everything was going on well. And one day I was praying, and this was one of those days while I was praying, the prayer was not going anywhere, you know, it's not, it's not feeling good. Have you ever had a prayer time like that in your life? Or you had always perfect prayer? Come on, be good, be nice to me. Amen? I thought I was the only one. Well, some people are here, they're nodding their heads. Anyway, good for you. And uh, so this was one of those days. So I was praying and it's not getting anywhere. So I, I thought, okay, let me change my prayer so I can feel good. So I changed my prayer and I said to the Lord, God, what is your will in my life? I found out that is the most dangerous prayer you will ever pray in your life. And I tell everybody, don't you ever pray that prayer. Because whether you mean it or not, God takes it seriously. That's a horrible thing. That's what happened to me that day. It's almost like God was waiting to hear from me and say, oh, thank you very much. This is a plan. I wanted to resign your job. I wanted to get out and go and preach the gospel. I thought, oh, 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 I didn't mean it. Well, too bad, you know. I was trying to tell the Lord God, it is not a good idea. You know, let me just hold on to my job and 
I'll do something, I'll give you some extra money to keep you quiet, you know? So it just didn't work. Anyway, I resigned my job. I took a shoulder bag, filled it up with tracks and my Bible. I walked out of my, on the road in the ministry. I had no idea what was ministry. Didn't have any idea what was I supposed to do. I didn't know how to preach. So all I did was handing over tracks to the people and telling them that Jesus loves you, you know. And uh, several weeks down the road, all the money that I had was all finished and I found myself in a strange place with no money in my pocket, no place to stay, and nothing to eat. What an exciting way of living, you know? And you got nothing to lose. And you can, you know, I used to sleep in front of the shops in the night because I had no place to go. And I used to walk about 15, 20 miles every day. Not that I like walk, walking. I didn't have the few pennies to pay for my bus fare. You know, I used to go without food for several days. My greatest miracle in those days was I have something to eat. Somebody gives me something to eat. You know, so this is what my life was wandering around. And, and I'm starting to thinking, I said, why did God call me? This is not getting anywhere. And I thought that God made a mistake because I come from the state of Kerala, which is on the southern part of India. And that's where Thomas came. You know, the Doubting Thomas, he came in AD 52. And we got a big, you know, uh, a place of Christianity in that state. You know, all Catholics and Orthodox and Episcopalian churches. So our people, they always named the children with biblical names. So if you come to that state, there'll be about 25,000 Abrahams, 30,000 Jacobs, and, and 50,000 Peters, you know, that's all the names. And I'm starting to think, maybe God did the mistake of calling me, thinking that I was some other Abraham. <laughs> because I was not doing anything good, you know. But... Uh, one day I still remember sitting in front of a shop, God's all upset. And I was telling God, why did you call me? You know, thanks for calling me, but I got no clue why you called me, tell me. I'm screaming at the top of my voice, two o'clock in the morning. I was angry, but God seems to be cool. Have you found that out? God never gets upset. You can throw tantrums, you can throw all your pots and pans, he'll be standing there smiling. I see, he'll say, have you done so I can talk to you? And that's what he did. He said, son, I have called you for a very specific purpose. And you're going to be standing before kings and leaders of the government as my witness. You're going to touch millions of people in this country. So you be patient. Well, that is our problem, isn't it? Patience is not one of the virtues we have, have we? You know? How do we pray for patience? We'll pray something like this, God, give me patience, but hurry, you know, because we don't have the time to wait. So I said to the Lord, you know what? You can keep those kings and leaders of the government for yourself. I don't care. If you really love me, give me something to eat. I've not eaten for five days, you know. <clears throat> that is what I was asking the Lord. Anyway, I said, okay, I have to do something about this. So, so I was going to start my ministry and uh, it's going to be street meeting because I didn't even have a penny. So I found a small area by the side of the road and I put up four poles and a tarp to make it look like a platform and a couple of gas lanterns. Only the older people know, you pump the gas and the mantle glows. Does anyone know that? You know, thank you. So, that is, so it's no expense. So uh, in India, the good news is that do you do anything, you can get a group of people. Everybody is wanting to know what this guy is doing. So I got about 200, 300 people, you know, at the roadside. And I think that God looked down from heaven and God must have thought something like this. He would have he said, that's the most pathetic meeting I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so then he said like something like, let me go and give him a hand. So God came down. How did I know? Because right on the roadside, I saw miracles happening. I saw blind eyes open. I saw lame walk. 
I thought people healed of every kind of sickness. People came running to give their hearts to the Lord. And they got saved and I baptized them. That's how my first church was established. And I'm standing before you 46 years later. I kept on moving from village to village and town to town. And here we are. You know, after all these years, I was able to establish more than 4,500 churches in about 23 states of India and reaching the lost for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. India needs Jesus because India has never heard the gospel. Millions of people have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. People are dying and going to hell because they have not heard the name of Jesus Christ. And we want to reach those people. I want to touch the lives of those people. And I want to see those people saved by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my heart. That's my passion. And that's what my life is. I just go through the rugged mountains, go through the remote villages, you know, reaching the people who are lost and bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the greatest satisfaction I have in my life after all these years of my ministry is that I have started several hundreds of churches in areas where we are the only church in the last 2,000 years. Nobody ever went. All those people who have gone to hell if I did not make it to that place. Amen? And today I'm standing before you, friends. I'm asking you, I'm so pleased to see all those flags. And I was looking for mine, and there it is. If you don't know my flag, there's a, you know, a little wheel in the middle, and then orange and the green and the white in the middle. That is my flag. Okay? I would have been pretty upset if I didn't see that. <laughs> I would have boycotted my preaching, you know? I would have lost all my offering, but that's fine, because that's my flag, you know? So it was wonderful to see people walking with their flags, and I was thinking to myself, you know, you carried all the flags of those, all those countries, but I brought myself all the way to be a missionary on the mission wheel. Amen? And that's, that's a joy for me. Hallelujah. And, uh, we wanted to reach the Lord. That's why I'm here. I'm not a great preacher. You know, that's, I'm not an itinerant evangelist. I'm here to share my heart and my vision and my burden that God has given me to reach those people. Amen? And, you know, get the people to support our work in India. That's why I'm here. And I'm standing before you, and one of the things I try to do is I try to buy a bicycle for my pastors. You know, they are like me, walking 15, 20 miles like I used to do. And we try to buy them a bicycle. They're not asking for a car. They're not asking for a, for a motorcycle. They're asking for a bicycle. It costs about $100 for us to buy a bicycle. 375 pastors are praying as I'm standing before you today that God will provide them a bicycle so they do not need to walk anymore. Amen? So we wanted to buy them the bicycle. You know, we try to support the pastors in India with $60 a month. I ask the people, give me $2 a day. Let us give a life to these people, a man, a husband, a wife, you know, three children working for the Lord, giving a roof over their head, putting at least one meal on the table so that the, their children do not starve continuously. Amen? And all those needs, you know, all these orphans, we give our people to support an orphan with $30 a month. And, and the needs go on. And Pastor Alex said he will take an offering at the end of the service. And whatever you give, I wanted to give for the work in India. I'm not here to ask you to give me some money to take care of me and my family. I'm asking you to help my pastors, help the needs, buy some bicycles, and help these people. And do whatever you can so that the work of God can continue on in the nation of India. Amen? And all I can say, just like I said in the video, God will bless you. And God will reward you for everything that you have done for us and for the work in India. Amen? Amen. Thank you once again, Pastor Alex, for having me to come and share with your people. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Well, it looks like I've got a few more minutes, so I feel like preaching. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm not the great preacher. You got one of the greatest preachers as your pastor. So, I hear him preach in Korea. You know, I enjoy his preaching and so I'm thinking, what am I going to preach in that church? You know, Pastor Alex being the preacher, but sorry for you today. That's all you got. So stick to it. Amen? And uh, so I want to share with you a story and bring out some of the things that God has put in my heart for you. Amen? And it is in the book of Second Kings, chapter 6. And the story, it is in seven verses. So I, I, I want to do something different, if you don't mind. I need seven people who can read the Bible in English to stand up so that he can read this story for me. Would you please quickly stand up? I need seven people. One, two, three, four, five, only two more. And five, you are there to read? Six and seven. That's it. Thank you so much. And we are going to read from chapter six of Second Kings, verses one to seven. And the people are standing. You have to have obeyed these two conditions. Number one, you when you read, you are only allowed to read one verse. Okay. Seven people are standing. Only where seven verses we are going to read. So don't cut into other person's words or be a Christian for a change. <laughs> Is that a good idea? All right. And number two, when you read, you read it loudly. So when you make a mistake, we can all laugh at you. <laughs> Are you ready for it? All right. Let's start. Verse one. And the sons of the prophets said to Elijah, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Two. Please, let us go to the Jordan. Three. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he said, I will go. Four. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they put down the Five. And six over there. just have learned this technique that when you don't have a long message to preach, you pick up a long passage and read it so that you can kill some time. And by the time I finish preaching, people will say, oh, he preached a long message, you know. Well, this is for preachers, no copyright, you can use it. Amen? Hallelujah. So, here is a story. You know, the story begins uh, like, you know, Elisha was plowing the field when Elijah came and threw his mantle upon him. That's how we read in the last chapters of, of the first Kings. And Elisha left everything and he followed the master. And then you come to the second Kings and uh, he has been going with him and now the time has come for him, for Elijah to be taken away. Uh, to heaven in a chariot of fire. So they start the last journey. And we read like this, that they started off from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, I want you to stay back here because God is calling me to go to Bethel. But Elisha said, no, I'm not staying back. I'm coming with you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. That's a plan. And then they came to Bethel. And Elijah did the same, stay back here, I'm going to go to Jericho. 
You know, whenever I'm reading this story, I, I always wonder why these two guys are having names so close to each other. <laughs> Have you ever thought like that? Maybe I'm thinking this thing because I've never been to a Bible college. You know, I got this weird thought sometimes. And I'm thinking if I'm preaching like, you know, you're calling Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, Elijah, and everybody's wondering what on earth he's talking about. I wish that one of these guys had the name John. What do you think? You know? But we can't change the name now, can we? So here we are. So they came and there in every city, there were sons of the prophets like pastors. And they discouraged Elisha saying, you stay back here because your master will be gone and you'll be left. So join with us and you can start a church in our city. They came and they crossed. Uh, they came to Jericho, came to River Jordan and, and Elijah took the mantle and beat on the water and the water divided into two. They crossed the river and there they were standing all alone. And Elijah said to Elisha, you have been a pain all this time. He didn't say that, okay. <laughs> don't, don't go and read that. And saying what this guy was preaching, things that are not written in the Bible. Just to find, make sure that you're not sleeping, that's all. Okay. So he looked at him and he said, what do you want from me? And I'm thinking, why didn't you ask this question when you started? He need not have walked all this way with you. But why? Why you didn't ask this in Gilgal or Bethel? You know why? Because Elijah wanted to make sure how serious Elisha was in whatever he wants from him. Amen? God wants to know how serious we are when we are looking for something from him. Amen? God doesn't enjoy wishy-washy prayers. God doesn't just say, oh, I asked it. If he wants to give, he can give. Otherwise, who cares? Well, you're not going to get it. But when we pray seriously, when we ask the Lord what we really want, and that's where it will happen. Amen? And uh, he said, oh, I've been waiting for this. And he said to his master, you know what? Ever since I started following you, I saw that you were different. There is something that is ticking within yourself. That makes you a man of God. That makes you a man of miracles. And I would like to have that something. The anointing that is in your life. And I would like to have a double portion of it if you don't mind. Amen. And Elijah said, you have asked me a hard thing. Have you ever thought the anointing of the Holy Spirit is a hard deal? We thought it is just so easy. But we have to realize that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the most precious thing that could ever happen in your life. It is more than speaking in tongues for 30 seconds. It is the power of God working through your life. You can break through every situation of your life because the Holy Spirit is upon your life. Amen? And he said, all right, okay, you can have it. As long as you will see me taken away from you. We know the story that the chariots of fire came and then picked him up. And he was running behind under the chariot calling out to him, my father, the man of Israel. And, and Elijah took the mantle and threw it upon Elisha. And Elisha took the mantle, walked up to the river, and he beat it on the water. And the water divided into two. And from that moment, Elisha became the man of God. Amen. And he asked for the double portion of the anointing of, of Elijah. And if you study the life of Elijah, Elijah did seven miracles. And he wanted the double of it. What is the double of seven? Oh, you're, you, you're good with them. That's this part of the camp. Well, 14. But when you study the life of Elijah, Elisha, he did only 13 miracles and he died. He couldn't do the 14th miracle. So, and he died and they buried him in an open tomb because there was war between Philistines and, and the people of Israel. And there he was, his body rotting and all that was left was his bones. And about a few months later, a, a young man died. And they brought him to bury him in the same graveyard which was right above a small hill. And just like every one of us, we we're going to have a few uh, good funeral surveys. A young guy died. So we had all the songs have been picked up. And the people are going to speak. And the senior pastor is going to do the burial. And everything was ready. And they came to the graveyard. As they got there, there was a problem. That was the Philistine army, the soldiers were coming from the other side towards them. 
So they didn't know what to do. So they had a quick talk with the dead man. Okay? How do you talk to the dead man? Well, listen to Abraham. So he, they said like this young man, we have a problem here. We're going to cut short the funeral service because if we hang around for too long, we are going to be dead with you. And we have got no plans of dying today. You are the only one who are dead and we want to keep it that way. So we are going to cut short and we are going to leave this place. We are going to get rid of your body. And they looked around. They first found an open grave. And they stood in front, middle of it, on the side and said, Well, in the name of the Father, Son of the Holy Ghost, here you go. Not quiet, okay? <laughs> they threw the dead body into the grave and they started running for their life. And the Bible says the body, the dead body of the man fell into the grave of Elisha. And the moment his body touched the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. Amen. Hallelujah. That is the anointing, my dear friends. That is the anointing we are talking about. The anointing is not the lipstick that you put on. That is not the nail polish that we use. Anointing is not on the surface. But I want you to know the anointing goes right down into your bones. Amen. Hallelujah. And the young man woke up and he was thinking, what am I doing here? I'm lying on the bones. And he got up and he could see all his friends were running and he's calling out and say, hey, stop for me. I'm coming. And the people looked back and the dead body was running. I already think about that, you know. So it was the Olympic sprint after that. That was the 14th miracle. And today we're going to look at one story. One of those miracles that we have read today, and we're going to share with it quickly. And the story, I want to do a little bit of typology. Here, Elisha is the type of God, and the sons of the prophets are the type of you and me. So that the story becomes relevant to every one of us. Amen? So the story begins, and the sons of the prophets came to Elisha, and they said, the place where we are staying is too small for us. And I say, this is a secret of church growth. Every church should realize that we are too small compared to the people outside of the world. As you heard your pastor saying that we used to attend the, the conference in Korea, the largest church in the world, 800,000 people. But I believe that even then, even that church is too small compared to the people who are lost in the world. Amen. So you and I can never be satisfied saying we've got a nice building, Beautiful auditorium, great pastor, you know, all the bills paid for, there's not much problems, let's keep it this way. No. We do that, and that will kill the growth of the church. And we have to come to the place to realize, no matter how much we, big we become, we are still too small compared to the people who need to be saved. Amen? Millions, multi-millions in India have never been saved, they got to be saved. People need the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And they said to him, that's what we got a plan. The plan is we are going to go into the city, into, into the river Jordan, and we're going to cut down the trees. We're going to make a place bigger than what we have. Amen? That's a good idea. That's how you do. You go and cut the trees and, and make the beams and, and make a, a building bigger than that. But that's hard work. But you should always can find a shortcut that is, what do you do? You get onto your little truck and start driving in the middle of the night, looking for empty buildings that nobody is using, and you pull down the beams and run away from there. That's easy deal. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about stealing the beams. I'm talking about stealing the people from other churches. You know, to build your church, that's the easy way of doing it, telling them that our church is better than yours. You know, we sing better songs than you and come along. But that's not God's plan. We have not been called. Our calling is not to transform, translate the people from one church to another. But our calling is to transform people's lives. Amen. That is our call in our life. That's what God wants us to do. So... He said, well, good idea, go ahead. But there was one guy who had some kind of a sense. And he said to him, you know, we have the plan, but we would like you to go with us. And it says, he readily said, I would like to go. And Elisha went with them. 
And I always say, how do you grow the church? You cannot grow the church with your computers. You cannot grow the church because of your graph in the office of your church. You don't grow the church. You can only grow the church through the power of God in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. So I always say, whenever you're going to do something for God, take God with you. He'll come handy for you sometime. Amen. So he went with them. And they got to the place and one man started cutting the trees. And the Bible says, as he was cutting the tree, the axe had slipped and fell into the river. I wanted to keep that in mind because we're going to pull it out in a few minutes as we're going to pray. The accent slipped. Sometimes it slips. You didn't mean to throw it. You were sincerely cutting the tree, but it slipped out of your hand. And you lost it forever. But the problem is whether it slips or whether it, you've done it deliberately, it doesn't matter. The consequence is the same. You have lost your, your accent. I'll call it the cutting edge of your life. You have seen an axe? Do you have axe in America? How does it look like? A handle and a sharp iron piece, which is called the axe head, right? So this guy just lost his axe head. And he's standing there with uh, ha the handle, which is a wooden piece of thing. And now the question is, what are you going to do when you lose your axe head? What do you do when you lose the cutting edge of your life? The cutting edge of your character. The cutting edge of your ministry. No matter, you, you fill in the blanks. But what will I do when I lose it in my life? Well, two things you can do. First thing is you can think, well, I'm a Christian for 30 years. I've got a great reputation in the church. I got, I'm in leadership. I'm in this and that. And what will the people think about me? So we tend to cover up. And we tend to live a life as if it didn't happen. But the only thing is, we know here, we lost it. Amen? So what do we do? Well, just bear with me for a minute. You'll turn your back on to the people so that they cannot see what is in your head. Only I know I lost taxes. So what I will do for other people, I keep on cutting. I keep on cutting and I'm panting. And I'm sweating. My swinging is right. Everything is right. Except the tree is not falling. I'm bruising the tree. Amen? Yes. Friends, how long we're going to live a life of deception? How long we're going to say to ourselves, I don't want the people to know about my life. It's a horrible thing, friends. We have to come out somewhere and find reality for our life. Amen? God doesn't want any one of us to live a life of deception in our life. Amen? That you can do. But what you could do, the, rest, the best thing is, what this guy did, he threw up his hand up in the air. And he was starting running to the, to the man of God, saying all the way, I lost it, I lost it, I lost it. And he came and stood before Elisha. And Elisha looked at him and he said, okay, where did you lose it? That's question number one. Where did you lose it? You know what the answer for that famous answer? will go on something like this. Where did you lose it? And it starts like this. <laughs> I don't know. We are a bunch of liars. Amen. Of course you know. Of course I know. Where did I lose? When did that happen? How did that happen? We know it. But we pastors like teddy bears will put our arms around you. Even if it is coronavirus, who cares? Put you go and hold on. And tell you it's okay, it's okay. But God doesn't play games. You know, you can keep crying, you can do anything. But he will look at you and say, stop crying. Tell me where did you lose it? Amen. Because he has got a plan. Hallelujah. And he brought it. He said to him, I was cutting this tree. And it slipped and it fell on the water. And he said, do you want it back? And that's my message, friends. That's my altar call, by the way. All right? 
And he asked them, do you want it back? And I am asking everyone here today, if you have lost your cutting edge, the Lord is asking you, do you want it back? And it all depends on your response for a miracle to take place in your life today. God has sent a guy all the way from India to give you the message so that he can start all over again. Amen. He said, yes, I want it back. And the Bible says he broke a branch of the tree. What does that mean? It means the branch of the tree is a type of the cross. And what is the cross says? The cross speaks about the grace of God. And he took that and he threw it on the water. And the miracle took place. And the accent started rising up and started floating up on the surface. And he said, you wanted it? It's there. You can stretch forth and you can have it for you in your life. Amen. Well, that's the end of my story. Stand with me. I'm going to pray. Everybody, please stand. Got to be somebody here who needed to hear the word. More than one. The Lord is speaking to you. This is a time where we can be, we can be open and honest before God. And I'm not presenting before you a God who is angry and upset and saying, you silly, you messed it up again. And I'm so upset with you. No, I'm presenting before you a God who is asking you, do you want it back? And the grace is flowing for you in your life. It's flowing here. And he's saying to reach out and take it. I want to give you back your cutting edge. I want to give you a, a new beginning. Start all over again. And that's what God wants to do for you in your life. Amen. Do you want your cutting edge back? The grace is flowing today. If you do. If you say to the Lord God, it slipped out of my hand. But I don't want to live like this. I want to be different. I want to start all over again. I want your anointing. Lord, I want my cutting edge back. I want it, Lord. And here's the grace. Here's the grace flowing for you. You're ready to take it? If you say, yes, Lord, I want it. I want you to raise your hands quickly, please. I'm running already over time. Just raise your hands. You say, I want my cutting edge. If you want the cutting edge, lift up your hands quickly, please. Because the power and the presence of God is here. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is here. Uh, the grace is flowing like a river into your life. And he's trying to touch you and change you. And he wanted to make you different from today onwards. If you're the one, don't keep your hands down. Keep it up, please. Because the power of God is here. The presence of God is here. He's reaching out to every one of you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray for everyone who has raised their hands towards heaven. I pray you'll touch everyone. Let the grace touch them. Let miracle take place, Lord. Give them, put them, the, the cutting edge in their hands, in their life, Lord, so they can start all over again and bring glory and honor to you. And I bless them. I bless them today. May the power of the Holy Spirit touch them. Lord God, do a miracle for them, Lord. Let it be a new beginning in everyone's life. We love you and we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor.